AMD has just announced the new 6000 series GPUs, also known as Big Navi, with very few surprises in terms of performance, but a few interesting choices when it comes to pricing and especially features, with Nvidia's troubles over stock for their RTX 3000s. It looks like AMD has a unique opportunity to take on the GPU market after years of falling short of expectations, but AMD's strategy for Radeon goes much further than just GPUs. The RDNA 2 event wasn't just a GPU reveal, it hinted at how AMD plans to leverage the success and brand recognition they got with Ryzen to entice gamers to move away from the competition in the GPU arena also. So what does this Ryzen plus Radeon strategy mean for PC enthusiasts? And how will Nvidia react to the Radeon 6000 announcement? If you are planning to build a new PC with AMD, Nvidia or, God forbid, Intel parts, you will likely need a Windows 10 key and today's sponsor GameFund365.com has partnered with us to get you a great price on a Pro key. I tested this service myself and the keys work globally. You get them instantly and that pasky Windows activation watermark will be gone in no time. Use the coupon code C20 to get an additional 20% off. Link in the video description. So, in case you missed the live stream, I'll quickly recap the big Navi specs. I'll put the full specs on screen. In short, the RX 6800 competes with Nvidia's 3070 with 60 compute units, 2.1 GHz boost clock at 250 watts, and it comes in at $580. Going up the stack, the 6800 XT competes with the 3080 with 72 compute units at 2.2 GHz boost clock at 300 watts while being cheaper than Nvidia's card. And the flagship 6900 XT competes with Nvidia's 3090 and comes in with the full 80 compute units at 2.2 GHz pulling 300 watts and it comes in at $1000. Performance-wise, the 6000 seem to slot somewhat in line with Nvidia's counterparts, but as you'll see in a moment, performance numbers are more complicated to evaluate than they seem on the surface. So if you look at raw 4K performance of the 6800 XT versus the 3080, you can see that they are pretty much even, with AMD being ahead in Battlefield 5 and Call of Duty, but being behind in Resident Evil 3 and in The Division 2. If AMD's results are to be believed, then it seems you'd have a hard time telling the two GPUs apart. However, if you look at Wolfenstein Youngblood here versus when you turn on the new features Rage Mode and Smart Access Memory, you can see that now the 6800 XT pulls a bit ahead. In Gears 5 there's an 8% boost with these features enabled and in Forza Horizon 4 it's ahead by 13%. While Rage Mode is basically an auto overclocking feature, Smart Access Memory reveals AMD's plans for their PC strategy. You see, in order to use this feature you need to have a Ryzen 5000 series CPU combined with a Radeon 6000 series GPU and an X570 motherboard. So this will be AMD's new narrative. If you buy a Radeon GPU for your current system, you will be matching Nvidia's best. But if you combine that Radeon 6000 GPU with a new Ryzen 5000 CPU, then you will pull ahead and get more performance than you possibly could with an Intel CPU or an Nvidia GPU in any other scenario, meaning your best option as a DIY enthusiast is to go all red if you truly want the best performance. It's a genius move from AMD and there's no other company that can offer this right now. Now, can you think of another gaming platform that has an AMD CPU and an AMD GPU? You can probably think of two, in fact. As I discussed in my video a few months ago titled AMD's Checkmate, the fact that AMD will have developers optimizing for RDNA 2 and Ryzen on the PS5 and Xbox Series X will likely give AMD a significant performance advantage in the PCs 
space. I have a feeling this smart access memory feature is just one of several things that will make combining Ryzen and Radeon offer performance advantages over Nvidia and Intel alternatives. You might have noticed that AMD barely mentioned real-time ray tracing during the Radeon event. Is that because their ray tracing implementation sucks that bad? <laughs> Maybe, but I think AMD knows how important real-time ray tracing is and they wouldn't be revealing these GPUs without ray tracing demos if there wasn't a good reason for it. In the footnotes on AMD's website for the Radeon features, you find this. Measured by AMD engineering labs on an AMD Audion A2 based graphics card using the procedural geometry sample application from Microsoft's DXR SDK, the AMD Audion A2 based graphics card gets up to 13.8 times speed up using hardware based ray tracing versus using the software DXR fallback layer at the same clocks. So that's using AMD's own hardware based solution, the Ray Accelerator, which you can compare to Nvidia's RT core. So if we extrapolate these numbers, this means the 3080 should be around 30% faster in real time ray tracing compared to the 6800 XT, right? Well, guess what ray tracing really likes? Many core CPUs. Looking at this new smart access memory feature, it wouldn't surprise me if AMD has a way to get additional ray tracing performance when you combine Radeon with Ryzen, where the CPU cores will also be leveraged to do ray tracing related operations. This would be inherited from the work done for Sony and Microsoft, which would explain why AMD hasn't announced it yet. But my bet is on this being a thing. It would add to the narrative of of Radeon plus Ryzen being the way to go if you want the best. It's pure genius. So let's do a quick head-to-head -head comparison and see what the pros and cons are between each competing product and see how Nvidia might react to all this. The $500 segment is usually where the majority of enthusiasts spend their money, so I'll start with the 6800. During the reveal event, my gut reaction was that this was too expensive for what is effectively a mid-range GPU, but there are a few things to consider. So Nvidia's 3070 has an MSRP of $500, while the 6800 is $80 more expensive. However, we all know that not only does Nvidia have a history of having their GPUs on shelves at a higher price than MSRP, in fact at a much higher price usually, we're seeing the 3080 going for around $100 over MSRP over on UAG, and of course as you probably know, the 3080 and 3090 show that Nvidia currently can't keep up with demand, and it's unlikely you'll be able to buy a 3070 even if you wanted to. Keeping GPUs in stock has been very difficult for Nvidia. There are several reasons for this, and recently in an article I wrote at Cortex.tech, I talked about ABF substrate supply shortages, which seems to be hampering Nvidia's ability to replenish stocks. This is an essential substrate needed for large dyes, and it seems AMD has been shifting some of their allocation for Ryzen to ensure there will be enough stock of the Radeon GPUs. Now it's also possible that Nvidia has been hoarding chips so that they can flood the market with the upcoming TI variants. So this all means that effectively the 6800 might be more closely priced to the 3070 than what the MSRPs would suggest. But there's something more important to consider. If you remove CAN benchmarks from the 3070 versus 2080 Ti reviews, you'll find that the 3070 only manages to beat the 2080 Ti in a single instance when looking at 1440p and 4K, which is in Ghost Recon Breakpoint where it bests the 2080 Ti by a single frame. That's right, one FPS win over the 2080 Ti in a single game. In every other game tested, the 2080 Ti, when looking at just in-game performance, is actually ahead by 3 to 7 frames, including in 1440p. It seems something is going on with CAN benchmarks, which is making the 3070 look better than it actually is. The reality is that in the Radeon event, AMD compared the 6800 very favorably to the 2080 Ti not to the 3070. So if you were to compare it to the 3070, the 6800 would look even more impressive. But $80 more impressive? 
Well, I suspect Nvidia's reaction to the 6800 will be to announce the 3070 Ti at $600, which will have the same die as the 3080 and match or beat the 6800 by a small margin. When you see the 6800 as a competitor to the 3070 Ti for $20 less, then the price starts to make a lot more sense. In my opinion, the 6800 should be priced at most at $550. Remember, this is effectively a mid-range GPU, but within the current GPU context, I don't think $580 is that bad. If you are considering getting one, then you have to ask yourself what resolution you will be playing at. If you are getting a 6800 for 4K gaming, then $580 is actually a great price because you are getting 16 gigabytes of VRAM, and assuming AMD's numbers can be trusted, you will get 4K60 at ultra settings guaranteed in current time. If you are getting the 6800 for 1440p gaming, then you will be wasting your money in my opinion. Pretty much any mid-range and high-end GPU from the last couple of generations can perform really well at 1440p, so get something like a 2070 or a 5700 XT if that's your target resolution. One thing I should mention is that small form factor PCs are a growing segment for DIY enthusiasts, and here the 3070 Founders Edition has a clear advantage with its smaller size, obviously. The 6800 is not huge by any means, but the 3070 does look like it will fit into smaller cases. I doubt the Founders Edition will be available for long and in decent quantities, so this is probably a mute point anyway. Moving on to the 6800 XT, the Nvidia counterpart, the RTX 3080, has an MSRP of $700, but is effectively selling for around $800, and that's in the off chance that you can actually find one. So assuming the 6800 XT does release at MSRP, then you are looking at a GPU that's on average about $100 cheaper and that you can actually buy. Again, assuming AMD has the stock situation under control. That's a lot of qualifiers, but even at MSRP, the 6800 XT looks like better value compared to the 3080, especially when you consider the amount of VRAM for what is decidedly a 4K GPU. I don't think you should be buying either of these GPUs if you are planning to play at 1440p, for the same reasons I stated for the 6800. The 3080 always seemed like poor value for a 4K gaming GPU, in my opinion, and the 6800 XT makes it look even worse. With 10 gigs of VRAM, the 3080 is always going to be on the edge of memory capacity for 4K, and that situation will only get worse over time. So looking at just the raw performance and value, it looks like the 6800 XT comes out ahead. We will discuss features in a minute. As far as Nvidia's reaction to this, I expect to see a 3080 Ti announced very soon, probably performing a few percentage points ahead of the 6800 XT and probably costing a thousand dollars, and perhaps with 11 or 12 gigabytes of VRAM. I don't think it stands much of a chance with informed consumers unless there's the off chance that Nvidia includes 20 or 22 gigabytes of VRAM. <laughs> Nvidia is definitely in a tight spot when it comes to positioning the 3080 Ti. And finally looking at the 6900 XT, which was Lisa Su's one more thing for this event, I think this GPU just makes the 3090 look even sillier than it already did. I think it's hard to recommend the 6900 XT when the 6800 XT already performs so close to it, but it's awesome to see AMD go for the top spot. A thousand dollars is probably a sign of things to come and it won't be long until AMD have their own $1,500 GPU. I've been hearing some rumblings about a water-cooled AMD GPU coming, so it looks like AMD wants the Titan market also. I'm a bit disappointed that the 6900 XT's design is so similar to the 6800 XT. I think a premium product should look more desirable than that, but that's by the by. If you are spending this much on a GPU, I don't think there's much I can say to sway you to Nvidia or to AMD. It's a Halo product that helps sell the mid-range stuff, and I personally think the small difference in performance doesn't warrant a huge price increase, but it's there if you want to spoil yourself, and that's definitely a positive change from AMD. It will be interesting to see how the 80 ray accelerators on the 6900 XT will impact ray tracing performance. Perhaps there's a world where ray tracing is so much better on the 6900 XT versus the 6800 XT that you can make the argument to buy the more 
expensive GPU. Now as far as a response from Nvidia, I really don't think there's much that they can do here. A 3090 Ti would have to cost $2000 while performing only slightly ahead of a 3090. I think that the only thing that's left for Nvidia to do is to move on to his TSMC 7 nanometer themselves and launch new GPUs on that process node. So that leaves most of us enthusiasts with the 6800 or the 6800 XT as our next upgrade, right? We should just ignore Nvidia. Well, not so fast. We need to look at something that I think is still very underrated and that's the extra features that these GPUs offer. Bear with me here. GPUs aren't just accelerators for game graphics anymore. They can do a lot more these days and I'm a bit disappointed that AMD isn't leveraging their GPUs for equivalence to some of the fantastic features we've seen from Nvidia recently. If you've been following my channel for the last couple of years, you know that I've I've always been very critical of Nvidia and their shenanigans that hurt consumers, but I've always praised Nvidia's AI software engineers for the fantastic work they're doing. Looking at AMD's features, like I mentioned earlier, one of the main focuses seems to be on combining AMD's CPUs with AMD's GPUs, so that means Ryzen plus Radeon. As you can tell by the GPU shrouds, even the Ryzen font now makes an appearance. But even though in a vacuum it looks like AMD's beating, or at the very least matching Nvidia's best and doing it for cheaper, drawing less power, all the while using a narrower memory bus, and when you add a Ryzen 5000 CPU into the mix you get even better performance. If we're brutally honest, the reality is that what we saw in the RX 6000 event was a handful of underwhelming games, barely any mention of ray tracing, no machine learning based image upscaling, and no killer features that go beyond gaming. Since that event, Codemasters showed ray trace shadows running on the 6000s in Dirt 5 along with denoising and other fidelity effects features. It looks very underwhelming, not to mention glitchy, but I guess the release version might have these small issues fixed. With Nvidia, at least in theory as I have yet to use these features myself, you get a lot more features like the Nvidia Broadcast app which is a game changer for streamers with those cool AI features like the background removal, RTX voice to remove background noises like your dog barking while you stream, and you get the webcam auto frame. There's also Machinima, which is probably the single use case where I can see the 3090 being a better buy than the 6900 XT. I'll need to test this for myself of course, so consider joining my Patreon so that I can actually afford to get a 3090 for testing. But anyway, I really like the idea of using 3D assets that are available out there to create my own videos. So these features along with DLSS means that NV Nvidia still has an edge when it comes to the things you can actually do with your GPU that go beyond gaming and make your PC experience better in practical terms, and you shouldn't underestimate that. These are the sort of features that once you get used to them, you can't go back. If you've moved from a 60Hz display to a 144Hz one, you'll know exactly what I mean. 144Hz seems like a feature you can live without until you start using it. If you are planning on streaming especially, the Ampere GPUs will become a necessity Necessity. And if you watch streams, you will indirectly be benefiting from these features, even if you don't use them yourself. And of course, another thing I have to mention is the drivers. I recommended the 5700 XT last year to viewers, patrons and personal friends, and I ended up regretting it as the GPU had serious stability issues for months after launch. I'm not going to forget the bad experiences people had and it's up to AMD to prove to us this time that they can release a GPU with with proper stable drivers. Yes, Nvidia have also had issues, but for the most part they've been doing a much better job as far as stability is concerned. So the question comes down to whether these additional features matter to you, or if all you care about is more frames in rasterization for less money. Given their limited resources, AMD chose to fight Nvidia from a different angle by making use of their unique ability to deliver both high-end CPUs and high-end GPUs. It remains to be seen if that's enough to get people to move over to the red team on the GPU front. I think if AMD really wants to take this CPU plus GPU strategy to the next level, they should create a special bundle where if you buy a Ryzen 5000 and a Radeon 6000 GPU, you get a discount because that's truly something only they could offer and perhaps that could offset the lack of features compared to Nvidia. At the end of the day, it really comes down to what you are planning to do with your GPU. 
and if it's all gaming for you, AMD seems to have this one in the bag. As far as I'm concerned, I'm super excited to play around with a 6800 XT and a 6900 XT. It's honestly the most excited I've been to use an AMD GPU since the 290X came out. Going back to the hardware announcements, I'd like to toot my own horn a bit by looking at the die shot of Big Navi, which matches what I showed last month with my exclusive look at the Navi 21 die. In fact, in that video, I calculated the die size using the PCIe lanes as reference, and I said it was 536 millimeter squared, and the actual die seems to be exactly 536 millimeter squared. In addition to get that right, the information that I published a few weeks ago on Cortex.tech with the final specs for the 6800, the 6800 XT, and the 6900 XT was spot on, with the exception of the CU count for the 6800, where I had 64 CUs, and the final product has 60 CUs. Everything else was pretty much correct, and if you didn't know, Cortex.tech was the first place to publish that information. But enough of patting myself on the back, because there were also a few blunders. Earlier this year, I said that Big Navi was going to be 2080 Ti levels of performance plus 15%, and I maintained that up until recently. Obviously, that information was incorrect, so I got that squarely wrong. I think my sources and I were jabated on that one by AMD, and you have to give AMD credit for playing it this well. In fact, I think this whole launch was really well thought out by AMD. They covered almost every angle brilliantly. Anyway, it's awesome to see Radeon back in good form. It's great to see GPUs from AMD that you can actually consider buying if you want the very best performance. And I think the future looks bright for Radeon. Who knows, we might even see some Xilinx FPGAs making it into the next generations of GPUs as accelerators, or even as co-processors, who knows. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification icon, as I'll be having some reviews dropping soon that you won't want to miss. Before I go, I'd like to remind you that I revealed and teased a lot of the exclusive information that was announced in AMD's event over the last few weeks and months even, with my patrons over on the Cortex Discord server. So if you are able to, I'd like to encourage you to support me on Patreon and get exclusive access to the best Discord server out there, where you can talk to me and other like-minded enthusiasts in a healthy environment. If you can't contribute right now, then please give this video a like, as that really helps. Thanks for watching and until the next one.